And the race for the White House 2024 is heating up and a familiar name back in the mix. You have two N-words, neither of which should ever be mentioned. I said that once. I said, oh, what a terrible thing to say. No, you have two N-words. You know what the one is, but the other is the nuclear word. Not supposed to ever be mentioned. Ever, ever, ever. It's mentioned every single day now. And even now you have a president going to Ukraine and you have people in Ohio that are in desperate need of help. And I was very proud to say that I announced I was going to Ohio. You know, FEMA said we're not going to give them anything. But as soon as we announced we were going, the money started rolling in. But it's not supposed to be that way, is it? Every day for the United States, though, is April Fool's Day. This just occurred to me yesterday. Because I see what's happening, I'd say, what's going on? What's happening? What's wrong? It's like April Fool's, right? We have open borders when they should be closed. April Fool's Day, right? Who would, open, who would want open borders with everybody just pouring in? Oh, yep, he's back, folks. And next November, Trump will run for his second presidential term in a renewed bid to make America great again. And as the woke wet wipes of the Western world continue to fall, the Donald had a personal message for one departing in Scott this week, wishing good riddance to scheming Sturgeon and condemning her doomed gender reform recognition bill. He said, the wonderful people of Scotland are much better off without her. Now, I must admit, Donald, I can't disagree with you on that. And with Nasty Nick following New Zealand's Be Kind dictator Jacinda Ardern out the door, while Justin Trudeau's weak Canadian borders allow thousands of migrants to flood the US northern border, it looks like lefty leaders around the world are finally in the firing line and not before time. So I'm joined tonight by Donald Trump's former White House press secretary, host of Spicer and Co, Sean Spicer. So, Sean, with Western states discovering that if you go woke, you go broke, is it time for strong leaders like Trump to take back control of the West? Absolutely. And I think you're seeing that. I mean, you saw it today. He was in Ohio uh, making the case for uh, strong leadership and, and basically making a huge contrast. Joe Biden and his top team haven't been there. They've barely spoken of it today. President Biden called Ohio's governor, Mike DeWine, for the first time 20 days after that derailment of that car that has uh, infected the groundwater, the air, the soil, uh, and, and, and really you know, put a lot of people at risk. So I, I think the president has made a huge contrast, but it's not just here in America. I mean, Dan, you're pointing out around the world, the president has been calling this out for a while. We saw a lot of leaders throughout the world, uh, whether it was you know, in your own country there or, or even in, uh, in Ukraine, a lot of voters said, we want something new. We want something different. We want uh, non-politicians. We want people who will fight for our values. Uh, so you saw that whether it's Boris Johnson fighting in, in, in the UK or Zelensky in, in Ukraine, um, you're seeing it throughout the world. And, and so Trump's calling it out where he sees it, whether it's here in the US or as you just pointed out in Scotland. And, and meanwhile, uh, I think we've got some footage of, of Joe Biden today in Poland actually tripping up some stairs, right, to a plane. So this is just getting worse, Sean, by the day. We have a president, a leader of the free world, who doesn't seem mentally competent, he doesn't seem physically competent. And talk to me about this uh, big move that has developed amongst the Republican Party to call for a mental competency test before you can become president. You know, Dan, I'm glad you brought that up. So Nikki Haley announced that she was running for president. She's 51 years old. She tried to make this about Trump, who's 76, and Biden, who's 80 years old. And I think this was a, an idea of trying to highlight her age and, and to kind of contrast this new generation of Republicans. Unfortunately, I think I said it at the time, and I said it even more so today, it really backfired. Number one, Trump embraced it and said, great, I'll take a test. Uh, I don't think anybody questions his mental acuity. Number two, all of these other people that are going to jump in the race, Vivek Ramaswamy, he jumped in the race today officially. He's 37 years old. Pompeo and Pence, DeSantis, DeSantis is 44. I mean, it was a talking point that was going to fall on deaf ears real quick. And the other thing that's politically stupid about it, frankly, is that a lot of Republican voters, primary voters, are older. They're 60, 70 years old. So to start talking about mental competency uh, after 75 years old is really, for a lot of voters, insulting. And you are sticking with Trump, aren't you, Sean? You have no doubts. Uh, even though I know you're not planning to formally go and rejoin the campaign, you have a, have a media career, you're, you're in, endorsing Trump, none of those other contenders you mentioned, even Ron DeSantis, are not tempting to you? 
Well, look, as you said, I, I'm actually contractually prohibited from publicly endorsing any candidate for any office. It's not just the presidency. It's uh, for, for a lot of reasons. I'm sure this is not uh, that dissimilar to what goes on in the UK. But uh, so so that's it. That being said, I stay in contact with Donald Trump. I'm still a supporter of his. Uh, we continue to talk and he's been a huge supporter of my career uh, on, on so many levels. And I'm thankful for that. But at the end of the day, just to be clear, yes, I support him as a friend and as a former boss and as somebody who achieved a lot. But but at the end of the day, I will always support the Republican nominee. The media, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, they did in 2016. They've already written them off. Are they wrong, Sean? Do they misunderstand the Republican Party base? Yeah, and I think you are absolutely right to point out the fact that they were wrong in 2016. Look, when it comes to the first step is obviously clinching the Republican nomination, right? And that entails getting the requisite number of delegates in each of the states. I think it's somewhere around 1,400 that you need to ultimately become the nominee. It changes from cycle to cycle. And so... Um, Trump, by having run twice before, has teams in each of those key states. You got to start in New Hampshire, Iowa, South Carolina, Nevada, then you head into Super Tuesday. Trump has an advantage, not just because he's run before, but the amount of data he has on those voters, uh, they, it is far surpasses anyone else who is going to get in this field. Uh, so I think he has a huge advantage in the race for delegates, which is ultimately what you need. So no matter how many head to head polls that I see out there at the end of the day, this is not how the game is played. You need a number X number of delegates to become the nominee. And there's no question that objectively speaking, Trump is the front runner when it comes to the who, who can get that those requisite number of delegates. No, indeed. Indeed. And obviously, we know that Lots of candidates in the race and there's going to be lots of candidates that look it's looking like, Sean, that is good news for Trump. That was very good news for him in 2016. It's going to be very good news for him again. Can uh, I make one, one, one quick point? Yes, one quick point. And, and that's it. I, I mentioned this, but a lot of folks don't uh, fully appreciate that. I mentioned those primaries in almost every state, whether it's a primary or caucus, there's a threshold. Sometimes it's 10, sometimes it's 15. It's as high as 20 percent. If you don't hit that threshold, you're not eligible for delegates. So if Trump gets 25 percent and if there's six other people that get nine or eight percent, he gets all the delegates from that state. That's how he was very successful in 2016. And I think that's important for people yep. to understand. Exactly. It might be a dirty race. It might be a long race, but exactly, he's got the right. advantage there. Look, Sean, talk to me about this media attempt to paint this new Trump campaign as more extreme than last time. I mean, there was a Rolling Stone report out uh, saying that Trump was privately discussing bringing back firing squads uh, as a way to uh, act out the death penalty. I mean, is that true or, or is this an attempt to try and scare people off him? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I put the Rolling Stones political coverage right up there with the Cartoon Network. Um, so I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a real believer in what they have to say. I've never heard him utter anything close to that. And again, if you're going, if, if I know it got a lot of attention here in the U.S. as well. I think if you're looking at Rolling Stone as a political source, uh, you've got to question how far you're looking to get your political information. Um, I, as I said, I've never heard him say anything even close to that. Uh, and, and so I, I don't put much stock into it. OK, great stuff. Donald Trump's former White House press secretary, host of Spicer & Co, Sean Spicer. Thank you so much, Sean. We will speak soon. Have a great night.